Hello everyone. Welcome to this presentation on terminal user interfaces in Julia. This is for JuliaCon 2020 and my name is Deepak Krishnamurthy. All the code and material for this presentation will be located on my GitHub at this URL. Okay, let's get started. In order to understand how to build terminal user interfaces, I think it's important to understand how terminal emulation works. I'm sure you've all used a terminal emulator on your computer in your day-to-day -day interactions with Julia. Maybe it is even your preferred way of using Julia. Today in this lightning talk, I want to share three analogies for how a terminal emulator works. And I want to offer thoughts on how those analogies will help us when building terminal user interfaces. The first analogy I want to introduce is that of a typewriter. Terminal emulators are used to mimic the role of terminal hardware, which were originally employed to access mainframes in the 1970s. And during the design of this hardware, a lot of the terminology and names used were derived from existing typewriters at the time. For example, originally carriage return referred, referred to the lever on a typewriter. This would make the type element aligned to the left side of the paper of the same line. And as, as a result, reset the device's position to the beginning of a line of text. This was used in conjunction with a line feed action to advance the paper to the next line. That is to move the type element to the beginning of a new line. This sequence is called CRLF for carriage return line feed. And sending the sequence in a terminal can move the cursor to the beginning of a new line. Terminal emulators to a large extent behave like typewriters. For example, to generate this animation, we can reset the cursor to the beginning of a line and print the text that represents the next frame of an animation. Most progress bar implementations in a terminal rely on using carriage return without advancing to a new line. That brings me to the second analogy, a canvas. Every terminal renders a frame buffer of characters to your display. The current location of your cursor is where you're modifying that frame buffer. So you can move the cursor around to any location in the frame buffer and modify it at that point, like a canvas and a paintbrush. Let's see how this would work in practice. So here I'm displaying some Julia code on the screen. This code gets the size of the terminal and moves the cursor to about a third of the way of the screen and prints the words hello and world in red and blue respectively. I've added some fun uh, calls to some sleep functions so that this happens character by character so that it's easier to see what's going on. And I have a predefined function to run exactly this code. You will see that we move the cursor to the to the line and start printing the words hello in red and world in blue. You will also notice that the string used to change the color is not echoed back to the terminal standard out. That is because this is an escape sequence. Around the 1970s, hardware terminal manufacturers came together and agreed on a standard called ECMA 48. Today, this is more commonly known as the ANSI escape sequences. And per the standard, a terminal uses the lower 32 characters of the ASCII table to control the terminal. So these are known as control characters. And these control characters let us print in bold, italics, and different colors. This Julia code that is shown over here, we're essentially tokenizing the Julia code and printing escape sequences before and after each token to get different colors, to get text in bold, to get text in italics, etc. We can do one more thing before we move on. Let's make this title a little more colorful. So here I called a function that moved the cursor to about this location and printed out the escape code sequence for the color that I wanted and then printed out the corresponding text. We can think of the frame buffer as a canvas and the cursor as a paintbrush and using these escape sequences to control where the paintbrush moves and what color we want to print in. The 
the last analogy I want to introduce is that a terminal emulator behaves like a state machine. A terminal emulator interfaces with a pseudo teletype device driver that exists in your operating system. Everything that we talked about earlier is achieved by sending characters on the wire. That is to say, sending characters serially in band over standard out or standard in to this pseudo teletype. This pseudo teletype maintains state. This means if you ask it to print something in blue, it'll continue printing in blue till you ask it to print in the default color again. Additionally, you can change the mode a terminal, op terminal emulator operates in. For example, by default in a terminal, all keys that are entered are echoed back to standard out. However, we can disable this echo and still capture all key presses. This is what I've done for this presentation. Any key I press right now will not be printed to the terminal standard out. For this talk, I'm also using the J and K key to move between my slides. There's a large number of other features that I don't have the time to go into right now, but you can check out the term iOS documentation or the term iOS.js Julia package for more information about this. So we've learned that we can draw what we want on the terminal and at the exact location that we'd like to, as well as intercept key presses to take user input. With a little async programming and the use of channels, we can build highly custom bespoke terminal user interfaces for our applications in Julia. Here's an example of a selection menu widget that shows the corresponding Unicode plots. I've bound the W and S key to change the, uh, the element that's selected so that I can cycle through the different options. I've started working on a package to abstract these into reusable widgets such as progress bars, markdown text, selection menus, etc. You can check it out in this link. This is also the package that I used to make this presentation. There's more supplementary information about this in the repository. That's all I have for today. Thank you all for listening and let me know if you have any questions.